Okay, I think we're live. Here we are. Here we are. Hello, everyone. Um, another Friday. Love your liver live stream. I'm sorry about. I'm figuring out. I got a new camera, and this thing's like a fisheye lens, so you get to see. This this thing is like a foot from my face, and it's still. Like, trying to figure that out. How to zoom. Got a live stream software this last week. Um, is the wrong mic on? Jiminy Christmas. Let me, let me see. Oh, goodness. We're going to figure out the mic thing right now. Should be on the right one. Okay. Is that better? Somebody in the chat, tell me if that's better. Um, I did just change the microphone. So if somebody, anybody, everybody scream. Anyway, somebody in the, in the chat, I just switched the mic from the, it was on the camera mic. Um, yeah, Van Geezer about the, the mic or the, the camera getting closer. I just, I never learned about a webcam arm. I just learned about that when, uh, people, uh, we're talking about this mic, the big fish eye. Um, but yeah, so anyway, I mean, this is, this is different, right? So anyway, so for those, I didn't know if I said this at the start, I am Dr. Garrett Smith, known as the nutrition detective around these YouTube parts. And what we do a lot here is we are destroying the corruption and myths you've been sold in nutrition science, science. If you didn't know, the same people who started pharmaceutical medicine, as in the Rockefellers, started nutrition science. So maybe that's suspect as well as pharmaceutical science. Hmm. Could never happen, right? They would never tell you lies. They would never want you to be sick. Never, ever. No way. They love you. They want as many people around as possible, right? Good people. They don't want people who question. Or they... They do want people to question. See, I'm going sarcastic, but I looked out of it there. Anyway, what we were going to go over today, lots of stuff. I think I actually deleted what I was trying to find. Um, so first I usually go over, wow, this, this morning has been a, a stuff show, if you know what I mean. Um, let's see, let me find the testimonial. So this testimonial that we're going to go over. So let me let me just talk about while I'm finding it. How do I address toxic metals? It's a big thing out there. Are toxic metals legit? Um, everybody out there loves to say that the liver and the kidneys don't store toxins or toxic metals. And they're completely wrong. If you want to go and search on PubMed, don't use the word store. You have to be smarter than that. You're going to use the word accumulate, A-C-C-U-M-U-L-A-T-E. You're going to use the word accumulate. And then you will find all sorts of studies that these uh, YouTube health experts can't seem to find. So it's it's all out there. Mercury, lead, cadmium. Absolutely. They'll say, you know, I saw uh, somebody posted, Dr. Berg said the liver doesn't store toxins except in the fat. So then go look up how much fat's in beef liver. There's four grams of serving. Wait, if the liver stores toxins in fat and all liver contains fat, weird how that can happen, right? Um, they're telling you what they want you to believe so that you'll keep eating uh, liver and kidneys and think it's healthy for you. Just so happens the liver is the highest part of the body in copper and vitamin A, two things that I talk about being toxic. But here we're going to go into a testimonial. Now, this is inside the Love Your Liver program. I'm not going to say the person's name because if you go and you use key terms from this testimonial and you're a member of the network, you can find this person. But I don't go and give people's names on the Internet, partially for privacy purposes. Part It, it is a private network, so they are OK with their name and their image being on the private network. But I don't want them to be out on the legit wider internet. So here, let me read this. So what it is, we, they, this, this person works with me and I talk to them about what 
I do about getting rid of toxic metals in the body. What I do, instead of doing chelators, now let me tell you about chelators, or, and this goes for your natural chelators that people think are so wonderful, like cilantro, which is mega high in vitamin A, or the other algaes, which are mega high in vitamin A. You're, you're um, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're, you're making yourself toxic with something else to try to get another thing out. Well, what if, what if we knew that good minerals that nearly everyone is deficient in because they're not in the soil anymore, who would do that to us? Hmm. Good minerals displace bad minerals and vice versa. So if you have a lot of bad minerals coming in, is it going to kick out your good minerals? Yes. If you have more good minerals coming in, you reduce the bad minerals. Are the good minerals going to displace the bad minerals? Yes. Can you, do you have to put in the idea that people will say, well, you can't get these things past the blood brain barrier. Look, if the bad minerals can go into your brain and they're about the same size as the good minerals, the good minerals can get into your brain too. Okay. Chelators means claw. So things that chelate what people think of as bad minerals, they grab onto them, they claw onto them. But the thing that people don't realize is that <laughs> chelators grab onto a ton of good minerals also. Chelators are guaranteed to leave you more mineral depleted, good mineral depleted after you're done with it than before. I learned, I, I really, really, really saw this. So most, most uh, doctors or practitioners you may have gone to who put you on chelators never really tested your good minerals. I would bet money on this. They test all your bad minerals to tell you how bad you are. But they don't test your good minerals. And they definitely don't test your good minerals after they're done chelating you and destroying your mineral status. The lowest zinc I have ever seen I was, I was trying to help my mother with her Parkinson's-like syndrome, which has been very difficult. Those of you who want to avoid, you know, you really, really, really want to avoid neurodegenerative diseases, especially those caused by things like aluminum and copper, which we'll talk about today, and lead and cadmium. You really want to avoid these things because as the neurodegeneration gets far enough along, I don't know how well the body can fix it. It would depend on the cause of the neurodegeneration. I don't, there, there is, as with anything, even like with a car, you're trying to re, you know, you're trying to rehab a car. There is a point of no return where they total the car. Think about this. If the human body got to a place where the, the daily needs of detox, like your normal daily living creates toxicity in you. If your normal daily detox load was more than you could handle, how in the world are you ever going to detox more stuff? See what I'm saying? That would be like the point of no return where things are only going to get worse because the detox system has been damaged and is so toxic that it cannot catch up even to the daily stuff. Okay. So this is not... An older person, this is a young person, very young person. So here, here we go. Quote, just wanted to share some good news. I posted a few months ago, a few months ago, that our one-year-old was diagnosed with lead poisoning. Her level at the highest was 29, and it is supposed to be under 5. For reference, over 45, you get admitted to the hospital and get chelation therapy. So hers wasn't emergency high, but also not a mild poisoning. I'm going to take an aside here. This is blood tests. Blood tests indicate generally acute exposure to a poison. Acute, that means short term. Most of the time, why, why waste, for most people who are worried about chronic toxic metal toxicity, doing blood tests is a waste of time and money is because the exposure happened way in the past. And after about 30 days, your body is going to remove most of the excess toxic metal from your bloodstream. It's going to store it places. It's going to accumulate it in places in the body because it wants it out of the blood so it doesn't affect your brain and your heart and kill you. 
This is why your body stores or accumulates. It is so it's not floating around in your blood. Your body will always choose the long, slow death over the quick, short, or, or over the, the quick and short death. This is why your body will store things is because it has, it, it, it's choosing, it could leave it in your blood and you could have really acute short-term complications or it can desperately try to shove it into places, your bones, your brain, your heart, other places, so it's not in your blood to affect all of you at once, especially your brain and your heart. So when you have toxicity that shows up in your blood, <laughs> Relate this to the copper toxicity we're going to talk about later. If you have exposure to toxicity in your, it will show up in your blood for about 30 days. When we're talking about toxic metals. After 30 days, it's basically been shoved everywhere. Later on, that's where we see it on hair tests. Hair tests can show you up to six months of exposure. If you take a full like inch and a half hair sample. But after that, that can get stored away and it doesn't show up anymore which is always really cool when we start doing the detox the way I do it with good minerals. And then later you see some people's like toxic metals just spike up off the chart when it wasn't there before. Why would it do that? The body's dumping it. It's finally got what it needed to displace it and push it out. So anyway, so here, let's continue with the testimonial. She says, by God's grace, I had a consultation with Dr. Smith shortly after her diagnosis, and he recommended zinc and selenium to help push out the lead, as well as vitamin D from sunlight. Her lead specialist doctor is nice, but of course, he doesn't have any solutions other than to wait it out. He did want her on iron because her ferritin is very low. I think it was a five before we started supplementing. Even now, it is only up to 13, and she eats tons of red meat in addition to the iron supplement. He's, this is the, the lead specialist. He says lead detoxing takes a while as it is stored in the bones. They usually hope to see lead levels come down by half every year. So let me do an aside here. Why was I wanting the child to get vitamin D from sunlight? And I would also add magne topical magnesium is something that we would use in there. How, how do we get lead out of Bones. Bones are mostly calcium. Lead can sit where calcium goes. So if we can get the calcium metabolism, that doesn't mean take more calcium, folks. If we can get the calcium metabolism of the body better, it will push out the lead. This is how it works. Just like in your life, you can, you can do more good things in your life and it will automatically push out the bad. Or like in your diet, you can just add more good things to your diet and it will satisfy your appetite and it will make you feel good. And then you automatically push out the bad things just by displacing them. This is how you can improve your health. This is how you can improve your life. You put more good things in. You force the, don't, don't always worry about taking the bad things out. Push the good things in and let those push the bad things out. Okay. So anyway, continuing. Between her very first lead appointment and second, earlier this summer, a span of six weeks, her lead had already gone from 29 to 20. She put an exclamation point. She just had a follow-up yesterday, and it went down further to 16. Not as big of a jump as the previous, but still good. We had a very crazy summer with a different kid in the hospital, several weeks of a car in the shop, and several other things, so I wasn't as good about giving her her supplements over the summer life, reality. So all in all, it has come down by half in four months. Whereas normally they hope for it to have every 12 months. Just wanted to share the good news. Happy to know about minerals that push out the lead rather than just waiting for it to slowly come down on its own. Thank you, Dr. Smith. She adds here, I should note for anyone who was curious, we didn't do a hair test or blood test to check her zinc and selenium. This would probably be the ideal, but not realistic in our current budget, but I'm basing her dosage off of her weight and what a normal dosage of these would be for an adult. End testimonial. So that's what we, we, we talked about it. And uh, I helped this person with normal, what I would consider normal doses 
for a child of this weight. And this is the results we get. No chelators, no non-essential supplements. This is, if you want to call it, real medicine. We are making this child healthier by putting in good minerals, which displace the bad minerals. And can I go into the research and show you that zinc displaces lead? Yes. Can I go into the research and show you that zinc, zinc, uh, selenium displaces lead? Yes. Do we know that lead binds to bones instead of calcium? Yes. So we can speed up the calcium metabolism. We stop doing things that like pull calcium from the bones like vitamin A. It all works together. So this person, as I, as I, as she mentioned, she is, she did a consultation with me, but we did not do the whole analysis on the child. We just did some basics. And this is the kind of results we get. So pretty cool, right? Will I've, uh, I've got a mic on the camera and, uh, I tried switching the, uh, the mic to make sure it was, uh, let me see. I have to access my microphone. Yeah. Should all be going now. Um, yeah. Whenever I switch cameras, I wanted to output device, input device. Yep. Should all be going. Okay. Well, if the camera mic is working, I've already started this and I'm just going to finish it. So I'll just keep talking. Sorry if it's, sorry if it's not great today, you know, changes, changes hard. <laughs> so we got that done. Now I'm going to have to, I did my research this morning on my phone for how copper, gosh, let's just talk about this. Is there an epidemic of obesity? in this country? Yes. One of the things that the hormone estrogen does is increase body fat. Is copper, in my opinion, a toxic metal? Yes. Does copper increase estrogen activity in the body and aromatase activity? Yes. Yes. Is nearly everyone in this country getting exposed to excess copper every day in the form of copper water pipes? Yes. Are people being encouraged to eat more plant-based diets? Yes, which are full of copper and low in zinc. People are being encouraged to eat less meat, which is means less zinc. And they so there you don't you don't displace copper. What if there was significant research linking copper to obesity? Now I'm gonna say this before I start. The exceptions prove the rule. The saying of the exceptions prove the rule is a very important one. It doesn't mean that everything causes the same thing in everybody. This is the mistake that everybody likes to make out there. This is why so many practitioners, especially the people who come to me, who are the anomalies, the atypical ones, who they went to all these practitioners, all the practitioners did the normal stuff and it didn't work for them. And the practitioners would do silly, dumb things like say, just do more of the thing that's not working. It's not working, just do more of it. That should, that should fix it. Doubling down, tripling down, making these people worse until finally they, in my opinion, they get lucky and they find me and then we start doing stuff that is within their capacity. And they start getting better. So what I wanna say about copper toxicity and obesity is there's a pattern I've seen. Pattern recognition is kind of my thing. About 95% of people in general, it's a common pattern, about 95% of people react one way. And about 5% of people react opposite. 
with things that tend to make people, when people come to me and they're vitamin A toxic and often copper toxicity, copper toxicity and vitamin A toxicity are like this. Funny thing, the birth control video, birth control, ruining fertility and increasing vitamin A and copper in the body are on this channel. Ladies, how many of you gained weight that you can't seem to get rid of from birth control? Whether it was the copper IUD, the hormonal IUD, the pills, whatever. Most women gain a significant amount of weight from the pill. Most, not all. Some women lose weight from the pill and they can never put it back on. I'm going to tell you, 95% of people who, when they get toxic, they get heavy. They get heavier. About 5% of people get underweight and they cannot seem to gain weight for the life of them. I think I went over a testimonial last week or two about a woman finally able to gain weight in a good way because she's always been underweight. I've been over this before. Underweight, unable to gain weight is a sign of a liver in deeper disarray. I'm trying to be nice here. I'm not trying to be a fear monger. When people are underweight, their liver is in a worse state. This is what I see. They tend to be more sensitive to things. They tend to have a longer way to get out. And some people where they're like, I've been underweight my entire life. If you're born with jaundice, your liver's been messed up since you were born. Like, this is just the way it is. Um, some people have been heavy their entire life. So, when I talk about copper toxicity and people go, well, well, geez, I'm underweight. I must not have copper toxicity. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That would be the incorrect assumption. You may be one of the 5%. Okay? So, let me get into this. So, let's go into the research. Okay. You find it. Oh boy. Got to get used to typing on my. Oh, come on now. The relationship between serum copper and overweight slash obesity, a meta analysis. That should be on there now. Let's see. I'm just going to take the last line. This meta-analysis indicates that a higher serum copper level might be associated with the risk of obesity in children and adults, and these findings need to be further confirmed. Hmm. And then just say, we'll take one other line. Compared with controls, serum copper level was higher in obese children and in obese adults. Okay, so we have that one. Let's do another one. Wait, 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 wait. Okay. There it is. Okay. The relationships between serum copper levels and overweight slash total obesity and central obesity in children and adolescents aged 6 to 18 years. Plug that in there. I'm, I'm working on getting a, a live stream software so I can put these on the screen soon. I just had, I had to get the new camera first. We're going, we're going in stages here. These last couple of weeks have been have been a little rough on me, so I'm I'm doing what I can. Okay, here we go from the conclusions of this paper. Serum copper levels were positively associated with body mass index and waist circumference, and elevated serum copper levels were associated with higher odds of overweight/total obesity 
and central obesity in children and adolescents. Okay, let's keep going. copper there. Overweight and obesity are positively associated with serum copper levels in Mexican school children. Let's plug that one in there. Are you detecting a pattern? Okay. Let's see. In conclusion, Thus, some from the paper, quoting, in conclusion, our results show an association of the presence of overweight and obesity with higher serum copper levels for the first time in Mexican school, school children. Okay. Let's... So let me find this. Okay, altered serum zinc and copper in Iranian adults who were of normal weight, but metabolically obese. So they're normal weight, but they're metabolically obese. And as they say here, the very first line, metabolically obese, normal weight individuals are potentially at increased risk of developing metabolic syndrome. Let's take this, there was one line in here. <laughs> the subjects with a serum zinc of greater than 95 micrograms per deciliter had 0 0.386 lower chance of metabolic syndrome. And the subjects with a serum copper greater than 131 micrograms per deciliter had an odds ratio of 1.423 higher chance of metabolic syndrome. These data remained significant after adjustment for age and sex for serum zinc and copper, respectively. Furthermore, our results strongly suggested that zinc and copper were the independent risk factor for metabolic syndrome in normal weight subjects. There is an imbalance between serum copper and zinc concentrations among individuals with metabolically obese normal weight when compared with normal BMI individuals with individuals without metabolic syndrome. I don't remember if I put this link in. Let me put it in. Okay, so so what do I shoot for on so they just said the subjects with a serum zinc over 95 micrograms per deciliter had a lower chance of metabolic syndrome. And subjects with a serum copper of over 131, which is really high for where I want people, I want people like below a 90, had an odds ratio 1.423, higher chance of metabolic syndrome. So higher copper, higher zinc, less metabolic syndrome. Higher copper, more metabolic syndrome. That's what they just said. Gosh, what do I talk about getting people lower in constantly? Copper? And what do I antagonize copper with? Zinc? What does zinc do in the body? It displaces copper, which is why if you take too much zinc too quickly, you can kick too much copper out of your liver too fast and make yourself feel bad. So for those of you who think you're getting like zinc toxicity from taking a tiny little bit of zinc, no, you're probably severely copper toxic in your liver and you are detoxing it too fast, it's going into your bloodstream and you're getting symptoms of copper toxicity. Common ones, fatigue, irritability, anxiety, depression, palpitations, very common. So what's the solution? 
less zinc. It's not more, it's less. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Then don't do that. Do you still need zinc? Yes. Might you need very little zinc at the start? Yes. So now I've, I've had people who were huh, argumentative with me saying that copper in water from copper water pipes is not bioavailable. Hmm. There are people out there trying to sell you on copper being good for you if it's bioavailable and that copper that is not bioavailable is copper's not that's not bioavailable is bad and copper that is bioavailable is good the definition of bioavailable is can it be absorbed can it get into your system so there's copper that's bound to ceruloplasmin, which I believe is a binding protein meant to protect you, not to transport copper to the places where it's needed. So there's free copper and there's bound copper. If you don't bind enough of your copper, it's extra toxic. Does that mean that bound copper is not toxic? No, no, not at all, not at all. So, so bioavailable, so the copper water pipes you may have going to and from your water heater. Go and check your water heater. If you have copper colored pipes going to and from your water heater, you got copper in your water coming out of your tap, especially more when you use hot water. If you live in a place with acidic water, it's going to take out even more copper from those pipes. If you see the kind of turquoise-ish blue green stains on any of your sinks you guaranteed have a ton of copper in your water you can get copper water testing strips i learned about these from from a i hadn't looked into it but a, a love your liver network member her name's betty she's awesome and she got copper water strips and she tested her water and sure enough she had copper in her water and then she got a shower water filter and the copper in the water went down to zero. Hmm. Don't let me forget to uh, mention that. Well, the, I'll just say it now. The copper water, the shower water filter that she tested to show that there was no more copper in the water after, after using it was the, it's mineralstream.co. Not .com, mineralstream.co. She tested it before and after the filter, the water before the filter and the water after the filter, and it took the copper down to zero. So based on that testing, did it work? Yes, it did. Would that be he healthier for people? Yes. So let's go into, uh, let's go, let's go find this series. There's a whole series on, so for the, the people who are out there thinking they're doing a revolution in copper, these people with high serum copper should be feeling amazing, right? They shouldn't be getting obese or normal weight metabolic syndrome. Um, Right? Shouldn't they be? I heard this group said that you there's no such thing as copper toxicity. Wow, that's quite a statement. Well, let's go into here. Here's this paper. Chronic poisoning by copper in tap water. Part one. Ooh, it's a multi-part. They couldn't even fit all of it into one paper. Continuing, copper intoxications with predominantly gastrointestinal symptoms. Hmm. Let's just read the first couple lines. Copper can induce acute and chronic intoxications in humans. Copper in tap water has caused a series of severe, se severe systemic diseases in Germany in recent years. Copper induced liver cirrhosis. God, wait, wait, are the people who say that that liver is good for you because it contains lots of copper and vitamin A. Wait, so so. A super high liver in copper induces liver cirrhosis. Wow. Liver cirrhosis is your liver like dying and shriveling up like a raisin, folks. 
Like it's scar. Like think of what happens to a grape when it turns into a raisin. Like imagine your liver doing that. That's cirrhosis, basically. Just visualize that. It's shriveling up and fibrosing and filling itself with scar tissue. So here we go. Besides cirrhosis, another type of disease with predominantly gastrointestinal symptoms has occurred, which likewise appeared to be induced by copper and tap water. In a retrospective investigation, we look for additional indications and proof that chronic copper poisoning has been the cause of the observed gastrointestinal diseases. All patients suffering from this type of disease had copper plumbing in their houses. The patients, children and adults, suffered from nausea, vomiting, colic, and diarrhea. In the group of infants, this is why, why do kids not like brightly colored foods, strongly colored foods, strongly smelling foods, bitter foods? Why do they not like it? Because they know what toxins are. They have not been propagandized into thinking that toxic things are good for you, for them. Here we go. Here's a smart infant. In the group of infants, one refused formula milk prepared with tap water. And the others suffered from persistent restlessness unexplainable screaming, especially at night, and or long-lasting diaper rash. What are some of the symptoms I tell people that copper toxicity can cause? Or let's say they take too much zinc too soon for them, and they dump too much copper into their system. What are two of the big symptoms that might be showing up in this infant? Restlessness. Well, what do I tell adults? I say, if you have trouble falling asleep initially at night, that's a copper toxicity symptom, a very common copper toxicity symptom. A child being restless, especially when you first put them down. Hmm. A child screaming, unexplainable screaming, especially at night. Well, how else would a, an infant in a, in a crib express that they're having anxiety? How else would they express that? Could they express it through screaming because they're scared to death of something? They may not know what it is. Like when a lot of us have anxiety, you just feel it. You don't know what's causing it. And long lasting diaper rash. Well, what do we talk about here? Toxic bile coming out of the skin causes skin problems. So let's see. The data, here's the one of the last lines. Oh, oh, wait, wait, here's an important one. We found that the disease can even be caused by copper concentrations below the allowed concentration given by the German guidelines for drinking water. Doesn't our government protect us so well? All the governments of the world, don't they protect us so well? Continuing, the data proved that copper in drinking water can cause gastrointestinal diseases and not only the better known systemic diseases, i.e. copper-induced liver cirrhosis. Copper poisoning must be considered as a possible cause of chronic gastrointestinal diseases in those countries in which copper plumbing is common, like Merca. Hmm. Chronic poisoning by copper in tap water, part two. Copper intoxications with predominantly systemic symptoms. Okay, let's just see. Da, 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 da. CCUP. Oh, chronic copper poisoning. CCUP. Our results show that, so they're talking about copper water pipes, part two. Our results show that patients with systemic Chronic copper poisoning are in a hypercupric, that's excess copper in the blood, state. The data thus firstly prove that indeed the putative agent, copper, is found in excess in the patients. And secondly, show that the estimation of free copper in serum and the measurement of copper in urine are reliable diagnostic methods. What were the symptoms? What were the symptoms? I don't know if they go over it here in this. Mm -hmm. Well, predominantly systemic symptoms. I don't think they're listing the systemic symptoms in here. Oh, wait, we observed that in patients with severe systemic chronic copper poisoning, not only the liver, which stores, accumulates copper, not only the liver, 
but also several other organs have been the target of copper. As a proof, copper overload has been measured. During or shortly after exposure, free serum copper, as in non-ceruloplasmin bound copper, was significantly elevated in all patients. Hmm. And they have systemic problems. Shocking. Is there a part three? Let's see. I don't know if it's popping up on the PubMed. One, two, looks like there's only two parts. Oh, well, so some of these people out there, these copper lovers, they love copper sulfate, oxidized blue copper. Copper sulfate, blue copper, the stuff that is sold to most people. Here we go. Simple. We're, we're on a page. This is a book about health effects of excess copper, as if this is new. Find it in T. Simple et al. 1960 reported an outbreak of copper poisoning from ingestion of tea that was contaminated with copper sulfate scale deposited in the water used to make the tea. The authors estimated the total copper in the suspension was 44 milligrams per liter. That estimate is unreliable, however, because exposure likely occurred after a large portion of the scale was dislodged in the vessel and the water used to make the tea was not available for analysis. Hmm. Well, so the reason, one of the reasons I got into the copper and obesity today was because somebody sent me some screenshots of a pro-copper group and a woman was like, I started on copper and all of a sudden I gained three or four pounds and I don't know where it happened. Okay. I know, I know uh, Will here. Um, he's in the Love Your Liver group and he's doing great. His health is improving. His weight is improving in a good way. He said that when, I think it was when his family moved into, or yeah, when they moved into a house that had copper water pipes or somehow they got into a house with copper water pipes, like everyone in his house gained tons of weight. He said this out on the open internet. So I, I you know, I, I feel comfortable with saying this. I'm not saying his last name, but anyway, Will was saying, Everyone in his family gained tons of weight when they moved into this house with copper water pipes. I'm going to guess that house had acidic water and they were not filtering their water. If you want to filter your water, I really like the AquaTrue water filter. It's a reverse osmosis, but it doesn't change the pH of the water. A lot of reverse osmosis systems out there seem to make the water more acidic. Is that a problem? Possibly. Um, Casey just said, maybe I'm an old gal, but I appreciate your YouTube videos where men or YouTube videos where men keep their shirts on. <laughs> Note, I believe she means liver king or something salad. I don't even know. I don't follow other YouTubers much. I follow some Christian YouTubers who discuss all the signs from revelations and other things that pop up these days, but I don't follow other health YouTubers. And no, you will not see me with my shirt off. Um, I mean, I'd someday, maybe if I decide to do it as a separate thing, because the changes in my physique from doing what I do and having a testosterone of basically 900 from this work that we do. I don't know if I told you guys, we now have, an, I'm 46 and I went over my labs video here on this channel where my testosterone was 893, pretty darn good for a 46 year old guy not on testosterone replacement therapy, because I'm not, and I will never do that again, ever. I did it a little bit, I talk about that in the video, and I show you my testosterone numbers. We have another gentleman who is 45. He's been doing the copper detox, or the vitamin A detox, this whole stuff, um, for a year less than I have. His 
45 years old, his testosterone tested at 757, and he's a year behind me in terms of this work, doing it for himself. He is, he is a client of mine. And we just had another person say that they tested at 800, and they are 46, they're my age, and they're at 800. We're going to have like a whole army of men with good testosterone, and everybody else is going to be going, you know, everybody else, you, you read the internet out there, and everybody's like, Men's testosterone is going down and down and down and down and we don't know why. Or they'll say why and they say other BS reasons. If you have low testosterone here, let me help. You're toxic. You very likely have zinc deficiency. You very likely have selenium deficiency. You very likely have molybdenum deficiency. You very likely have magnesium deficiency. You very likely have potassium deficiency. If only there was a way to assess all of these and treat them in a scientific and individualized manner. Oh, if you want to do that, you should contact me. NutritionDetective.com under the consultations tab. This is what I do. I put proof of concept out there. I can't wait to do my next labs. And I think I'm going to do them in November. That's about the six month mark. I test people's labs. I do four blood tests. I'm getting those results with people's testosterone with four blood tests. Four. How many of you go to functional medicine practitioners and they run 50 blood tests on you? And then you come out of there and they try to give you $300 a month worth of supplements. And you don't get anywhere. Maybe you get worse. I run four blood tests and a hair analysis. Now, when I do my labs for YouTube, I run probably a thousand dollars worth of labs because I'm doing proof of concept. I want to run all my bile acids. I want to run my testosterone. I want to run vitamin D. I want to run vitamin A, all the vitamin A markers. I do that for proof of concept because my stuff works. So I like to show people, but when I treat people to save them money and, and because I'm only going to treat actual causes, Vitamin A toxicity, iron overload or deficiency, zinc deficiency is super common, copper toxicity is super common, and then all the things I get from hair testing, magnesium deficiency, selenium deficiency, molybdenum deficiency, I get a second view of zinc and copper, and we start fixing it. The supplements I took, the main supplements I took Based on testing, I used topical magnesium and some potassium. I used zinc and selenium and molybdenum based on testing. We do have the Keystone Minerals over in the store, which is a basic foundational combination of those things. It may not be enough for people. It might be too much for some people. But you got to start somewhere. And then I use the lactoferrin, which is also available in our store at nutritiondetective.com. Those were the two main supplements. Two, well, I, use, I use some keystone minerals. I'm not using as, I used to use two. I do not suggest people do two. Let me say that again. I was using two keystone minerals. I was testing myself. I do not suggest people use two keystone minerals without testing. I absolutely do not suggest it. So if you hear me saying I just use that, I didn't tell you to take it. The label says take one, unless you're under the guidance of a healthcare practitioner. So if you go out and you take two pills, that doesn't mean it's gonna work for you. That might be too much molybdenum for you. That might be too much selenium for you. That might be too much zinc for you. If you're not testing, you're guessing. And you might be messing yourself up. And don't come back and say that I did that to you. I'm testing. I'm not guessing. Now I'm not on two keystone minerals. Why? Because I'm testing. See? Two keystone minerals is a temporary dose. Temporary dose. I warn everyone. Two is a temporary dose. You're not on this forever. So, 
two different main supplements. I mean, you could break it into the zinc and the selenium and the molybdenum and you can do customized doses, which is what I do on a daily basis. I may be working on products so that people can individually dose minerals in a very, very fine-tuned way. I might be working on those. That'd be pretty cool, right? So, copper. What do I suggest so that you can stop poisoning yourself with copper in your house? First, you should never, ever drink tap water. Your fridge filter is, it is a filter. It's garbage. I mean, it does, it's better than nothing. But carbon-based filters, charcoal-based filters, which is what most water filters are, they take out some, they take out some of the organic toxins. They don't take out minerals. Places brag that, like Berkey, you like Berkey? Berkey advertises that they do not take the minerals out of the water. Well, some people might think that's good. Other people go, well, what about the copper in the water? What about the uranium in the water? What about the arsenic in the water? Go to EWG and look up their water database for your area. There's all sorts of crap minerals in your water. You don't want the minerals in your water from the municipal water supply. If you have well water, oh my gosh, well water is a disaster many times. Iron, hydrogen sulfide, all sorts of stuff. Get an AquaTrue reverse osmosis water filter. I don't care if you wet countertop, whatever. It tastes good and it doesn't change the pH of the water. And then if you want a shower filter, the mineral stream is the mineralstream.co is the one that I have seen lower copper in the water. If you want a bathtub filter, a bath faucet filter, I don't, I don't, I have not tested that. People can put up all their opinions about what I suggest. I'm just out here getting people better. Alexei did a super chat. Thank you, Alexei. I appreciate that. She's what do you or he um, says, what do you know about the copper in complex four of the mitochondria? The consensus is that it's necessary there. And but even if true, that would mean we still need a very teeny tiny amount for that purpose. Well, let me tell you. For those of for those who worry about copper deficiency. I don't share the concern. Let me, let me remind people that the way we got into this vitamin A toxicity mess was believing cell studies and in vitro studies, receptor studies and mitochondrial studies and all this stuff. They gave, they use retinoic acid in basically Petri dishes and they're like, oh, we saw something good happen. And then you put that into people and you get the disasters of retin-A and Accutane, the absolute unmitigated disasters of isotretinoin and tretinoin, which are made in the body from vitamin A. And people will say, well, it's the active form of vitamin A. You need it to do things because in these cell studies, it did something that we think is good. Well, in the whole body, it wasn't good. Copper is very likely to be the same thing. Now, I get all muscle meat. I get, I get nose to tail carnivores. But especially I get all muscle meat carnivores. So they're only eating muscle meat. And what do I see in their blood test? They're not supplementing most of the time when they come to me. Uh, let me, let me, let me preface this. An all muscle meat diet, why a lot of people might have improvements, especially at the start, it's because it is a very low vitamin A diet. And it's a very low copper diet overall. It's also a very high zinc diet. Well, wow, that sounds pretty good. Well, they still have normal copper levels. Their copper levels are often in my range. They're eating a low copper diet. Are we concerned about copper deficiency in them? It doesn't seem to be happening. But their health is, is improving for a while. Why would all muscle meat carnivore people be coming to me if it was for those, of the, those out there who think that it's the perfect diet? Why would they be coming to me if it's the perfect diet, folks? Maybe it's a, per, I always, I use muscle meat with people as the foundation of most people's diets. 
Now there's that 5% of people or less who might not do well on any meat at all. And am I open, am I open to them telling me that like I eat any kind of meat and I feel like garbage. Okay, don't eat it right now. Maybe later, but maybe never. That's okay. Why would I want to tell people to eat tons of meat if they said every bit of meat I eat makes me feel terrible? What if somebody's like, this is the best gasoline on the planet. And you're like, when I put it in my car, my car engine breaks. But this is the best gasoline on the planet. Do you see how stupid that would be? So, I'm not going to say, and I haven't said, that copper is completely, absolutely unnecessary in the human system. I do typically still give people who have low copper on blood testing. I still give them copper antagonists very slowly and very gently, and we help recover their health all the time. I just had somebody who had chronically low blood copper, multiple tests, and we've been working with them, doing what I do, testing their zinc and copper in blood and hair, giving them copper antagonist that everybody on the internet says, if you take zinc, it will deplete your copper and you will get copper deficiency. And you want to know what happened to this person? I just tested their blood. Their copper came up out of the low range into the normal range. How does that work, Dr. Smith? That's not what the research says. The research says you have to take copper with your zinc to balance it out. Maybe the research is really just telling you what a majority of people, what happened to a majority, basically, of people in a study. That doesn't mean it's everybody. Doesn't mean I give everybody the same doses of things. So, I have not seen, now, let me back up here. For those of you out there who overdo things, gosh, no one here ever overdid anything in their quest for health, right? I would have never done this in my past. And that's sarcasm. I absolutely overdid things. How do you think I got here? How do you think you find out what the true nature of something is? You overdo it. Right? How do people figure out the true nature of coffee as a poison, for example? Oh, they get up to like drinking a pot a day or two pots a day. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I have no energy ever. Why am I, why do I feel so bad all the time? Why am I like anxious all the time, but tired all the time? Tired, but wired. You figure out the nature of things by overdoing them. Well, if you go out and you take tons of zinc without testing, so you're just guessing, could you cause yourself zinc toxicity? Sure, yeah. Might that also look on your labs like copper deficiency? Yeah. What's the fix? Is it to necessarily take copper? No, a lot of case studies in the research, they just have people stop taking the stupid amounts of zinc they were taking. And then everything fixes itself. So were they fixing a copper deficiency or were they fixing a zinc toxicity? You can over, you could give yourself a heart attack by taking too much potassium. Does that mean that potassium is bad for you? No. With essential nutrients, truly essential nutrients, you need them. They're essential. Can you overdo them? Yes. For things that are not essential nutrients, like, oh, maybe vitamin A, where we know they're toxic, so they're not needed at all, shown by testing in our people where they're still plenty alive when their vitamin A is basically undetectable by lab limits. If we know it's toxic at a certain amount and it's not essential, here, let me help you analyze this. It's a poison. It's not essential and it's toxic. So I do like the cabbie, right? It's, it's a poison. It's very simple. If you need something that's essential, truly essential, Magnesium, potassium, sodium, zinc, selenium, molybdenum. 
and you don't and you don't get enough of it, you have problems. Could you take too much of it? Yes. Do you need to have water in your body? Yes. Could you drink enough water to kill yourself? Yes. It's the same logic. Okay? So, copper lovers, tick tock, tick tock. Wait, who is this? Oh, Will said Mike. Yeah, I was looking. I saw the super chat from Will. Thanks for that, Will. Um, the mic check. Yeah, maybe I'll figure this out next time. Um, I'm not bad with tech. It's just doing the live stuff. Can uh, I, I just set up this camera yesterday and I didn't I didn't even run a Zoom thing on it beforehand. So sorry about that, folks. Okay, let me get to a couple questions before I gotta go. Samelli asks, what do you think of calcium D-glucurate overrated and maca, a cruciferous vegetable super high in sulfur, probably high in copper too? Uh, I've read that calcium D-glucurate can help if you have been taking Accutane. It can help glucuronidate some of the toxins. I think it's mostly theory. Uh, different people will react to different things. Could it help somebody for a while? Yes. Does that mean they're dealing with the root cause? So... Does that mean they're dealing with the root cause of their poisoning? No, not necessarily. So if it, if, if it, I mean, I don't like the idea of adding extra calcium to people's systems when they don't need it, especially when they've already been vitamin A poisoned with Accutane, which does what in the body? It raises calcium, hypercalcemia. Go look up hypervitaminosis A and hypercalcemia. That is a huge part of the vitamin A toxicity mechanism is it raises calcium in the body so would i want to go and throw in a bunch more calcium with a supplement no absolutely not i have not found adding glucurate or glucuronic acid to the system to be necessary other than with food i am more interested in getting the vitamin a intake down doing what we can with food to reduce the copper intake getting the antagonists of vitamin A and copper toxicity in zinc, molybdenum, selenium, getting electrolytes right because those can help symptoms improve almost immediately like potassium and magnesium and sodium. Not magical, unprocessed salts that have all the toxic minerals in them as well. Nope, don't use those. We don't use them. It's amazing how I, I have people doing supposedly all the wrong things based on all the internet health gurus, and yet I'm fixing all these things. I'm hell. I'm. I didn't say I'm not fixing them. I'm sorry. I I I came off incorrect when I. That's not the way I want to come off. I help people to help themselves to help their own body to fix their problems. I do not cure anyone. No doctor cures anything. A doctor puts a cast on a leg, the body, God, if you, if you would rather, fixes the problem. The doctor doesn't do anything. The doctor can help create the environment that will help the body to do the work that it knows how to do. By me removing, by me, I'm sorry, by me helping people to learn what toxins are and how to get rid of them faster, I am helping their body to undo the toxicity by me looking at tests and symptoms and giving people the true essential minerals that they need to fix the problems. Their body now has the tools that it needs to fix the problems. So let me, if I ever came off as saying I fix, I, I, I may have said that for, for um, what I want to say to be concise. Because I don't want to explain this every time. But I don't fix anything. I give people the tools they need. I am a teacher at heart. I am a guide back to health. Because everyone has to figure out what they need on their own. I see people on Twitter, they're like, you need to take 50 milligrams of zinc picolinate a day. And I'm like, <laughs> no. No. And they're like, because that's what worked for me. And you're like, you're not everybody, bro. 
oh, the muscle heads on Twitter are just the worst. The muscle heads who think they're experts in supplements because they're like 25 years old and they're juiced. And then they're going to, don't take nutrition advice from 20 somethings. Here's, here's a good life lesson. Don't take nutrition advice from 20 somethings. That's just a good general thing. Exercise advice really either because they're still riding youth. Youth is magic. You can abuse the hell out of you. I, the thing I want to, I want, I want you to, if you only go by, why do I put my labs up here? And I post some pictures of myself at the gym on my Instagram, places like that. Why do I do this? Because I want to show the labs. I will go through my history of things that I've gotten rid of. And I want to show the physical outcome. If you only judge somebody's effectiveness by what they look like, you know how many bodybuilders die early? Like, you know, they, they, people who look really good often are really dying early. Why would that be? Because you can do things that make you lean or big that are absolutely unhealthy. It's the way it is. So if you only judge people based on their like super lean or whatever, you're going to probably get led down the wrong road because the people doing that to you are purposely doing things to make them look a certain way, not about health. Oh, this is a good question. Simon asks, what are the three biggest mistakes that your clients make that hinder their progress? Well, the biggest thing... Well, I'm, actually, you want, I'm going to go over the biggest thing. One of the biggest mistakes I see intelligent people make, who I've worked with, is they do one round of testing with me, and then they think they know how to do what I do. They overestimate their abilities. There, there was a story about a... Oh, I, I, it was a woodworker who, who has an apprentice and the apprentice does everything perfect. And it ended up that the, the, uh, the experienced woodworker didn't want to hire the apprentice at the end of it because the apprentice wouldn't know what to do when he had an error and how to fix it because he always did everything right, right? So he had never made a mistake. He didn't know how to troubleshoot. See where I'm going with this? I've got... 16 years of troubleshooting under my belt and somebody comes in and they do one round of testing and then they think they know how to do what I do if problems arise this is this is a, that's one of the biggest mistakes that people make is they don't continue testing because they think oh it'll just be cheaper I'll just run my labs and I'll do it myself and I'll hope that I know what to do and then they see like, let's say a really high zinc on their hair test and they don't know what to do about it because their blood test doesn't match it. Or they see some, something I say is toxic spike way up on their hair test and they don't know whether they have, they have a poison coming in or whether it's a poison leaving. There's ways of assessing this. So that's one. The next thing is that people don't get their potassium right, and they don't spend enough time addressing their potassium issue. I have at least one article, if not multiple articles in the Love Your Liver program about how to work on your potassium. I talk about foods. I talk about supplements. I give people limits of how much to go up to. People, for if you're out here and you're on the program, you're in the Love Your Liver program, or you're out and you're not, you don't know what to do about potassium. Potassium is, potassium is the thing that if you could do it right today for yourself, I could bet that symptoms would decrease by anywhere from 25 to 50% by getting your potassium right. Is that going to happen overnight? No. Does that mean you should go out and start shoveling down potassium pills or potassium powder? No, it doesn't mean that. This is not a game. 
lots of the symptoms associated with vitamin A toxicity and copper toxicity and vitamin D supplement poisoning, because it's rat poison, are associated with inducing potassium deficiency. I have a saying here that the poison always wins. So let's say, like I said earlier, that people were pushing zinc too hard or molybdenum too hard or even selenium too hard. Weird that those three things I use are all copper antagonists in the literature, isn't it? Hmm. And yet I still don't have people going super duper low copper. It's amazing what a useful and intelligent approach to these things can do. Instead of fear mongering about making copper unbioavailable or whatever. Using outdated studies on all trans retinoic acid to try to prove your ceruloplasmin point. Don't do that. I've been over that before. I think I lost my train of thought there. Anyway. Oh, potassium. I tell people that they should try three main types of potassium. They should give all of them a try. It's like $10 a bottle. And they should go up slowly and I give them limits. Oh, so copper, so detoxing too fast could cause you to get very copper or very potassium deficient. Potassium may help the symptoms. But let's say people keep pushing the detox too hard and they keep dumping too much stuff out of their liver and they keep taking more and more potassium. The saying, the poison always wins. They keep dumping too much toxic bile, dumping too much toxic bile. It's got vitamin A, it's got copper, and it's got all sorts of toxic metals in it. It's going into your system. It's causing you potassium deficiency symptoms. You don't stop the dumping. Doc, it hurts when I do this. Then don't do that. So what should they be doing? They should be backing off on the detox pushers. But what do they do? They want to get clean detox as fast as possible. So they keep pushing it. And they keep finding that their potassium needs keep rising. And they keep taking more and more potassium. Eventually, what will happen is they will still be toxic. The poison will always win. And they will eventually, if they make this mistake, they will keep taking more and more and more and more potassium until they become potassium toxic. I had to tell somebody the other day to stop taking so damn much potassium. They did not listen to my instructions in my articles of where I give a limit on a daily amount. And now they were wondering, could the potassium I'm taking be causing me to have some problems? And I'm like, yes, you're taking too much. That's why I put limits on it. This is not a game. Somebody else was doing way too much of something that we talk about in the Love Your Liver program, and they ignored all the signs. And they kept pushing it and pushing it and pushing it. And then they're like, I'm really messed up now. And I was like, I don't know where you would have gotten the idea that pushing it every, you guys hear me every week here. Do less, stop, slow down. When it, doc, it hurts when I do this, then don't do that. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. Well, let me tell you, the definition of insanity is doubling down, tripling down. Don't do it. If something makes you feel bad, the answer is not to do more. Even with what I think is good judgment and good guidance in the Love Your Liver program, people still mess it up. They get a swift kick in the butt from their own toxic bile coming out too fast. And then I'm there to tell them, stop, don't do that. This is what I, this is what I talked about in the articles. You're doing it. Don't do that. Oh, one last thing. So since we're here, uh, don't forget, so only subscribers get to post in the chat. Please like the video. It helps the algorithm. Comments, whether you just want to make a short comment of you liked the video or whatever, comments help the algorithm to spread this to more people. So if you want to spread this to more people, leave comments, 
leave likes, subscribe to the channel, share this, do all those things that the, the AI loves. We don't love necessarily the AI, but we want the AI to love us, right? So anyway, um, so let's see. Butch was saying, was reading Grant's site the other day, question, does casein promote cancer? Casein is one of the main milk proteins. It is the, the milk protein that tends to make curds, like cottage cheese type of, cottage cheese is mainly casein. Casein and whey, I have an article. Grant talked about it. Let's go forum. So this is my old, this is going to be a link from my old research forum. You can call it casein, casein, whatever you want to call it. Um, whey contains vitamin A. Casein contains vitamin A. Weird that if whey contains vitamin A, why there's been some research out there showing that Chronic whey protein consumption for all you trying out there to get big was associated with an increased later risk of diabetes. But it's protein. Well, it's vitamin A protein. Would I encourage consuming? I generally, I'm just going to be blunt here. This has been known in the health field, like since before pasteurization. In general, more dairy consumption or dairy product consumption was has always been kind of known in the alternative health field as something that's generally not good for health. This pattern has been in, in alternative forms of medicine for a really long time. Dairy is generally something that if you have health problems, you'll probably do better with less of it. Are there exceptions? The exceptions prove the rule, right? Are there exceptions? Sure. But am I going to go out and say that everybody should drink raw milk? No, I'm not. Oh, but it's only the eight. Wait, you got to have raw milk and you got to have A2 milk. I don't even remember. I don't care. I don't care. You want to drink milk? Good luck. I hope it works out. I'm not expecting it to. It's full of vitamin A. It's full of vitamin D. It's full of calcium. All three of those... Vitamin D toxicity, hypercalcemia in the blood. Vitamin A toxicity, hypercalcemia in the blood. Add calcium to things that cause hypercalcemia in the blood, you've got a, sh a stuff storm. Go ahead. I hope, good luck. Good luck. I don't think it's going to end well. Does casein contain whey? Yes. The China study. What were they feeding the rats in the China study where they'll say, this is the, the China study is the stupidest thing ever where the guy's trying to equate eating meat in humans to overfeeding rats with casein, a dairy protein that's processed and dried. And it starts to turn a yellowish tinge, which might be showing that there's vitamin A in there. Why is cream white? Dairy cream, why is it white? But butter is yellow? What might happen in the making butter process? Oxidizing vitamin A, making it turn more yellow. Casein that they use in animal studies is a, it's not white, it's a light yellow. Research shows that there's vitamin A in there. Oxidizing vitamin A moves it along the quote unquote detox pathway, but actually retinol to retinaldehyde, to retinoic acid. This is a process called um, intoxification or biotransformation is where certain toxins actually get more toxic as the body puts them through the steps. This happens with vitamin A. Retinol is not as toxic as retinaldehyde or and worse is retinoic acid. That's Accutane. That's retin A. That's isotretinoin, tretinoin, vitamin A actually gets more toxic as it goes through the detox pathway. This is a known process called intoxication or biotransformation. So why would these things turn yellow? Because they contain vitamin A. I mean, you can't avoid vitamin A in foods. 
I've always said this. Grant's always said this. Grant's diet of beef or bison and black beans and brown or and white rice is not vitamin A free. Don't delude yourself. Grant doesn't say that. It's very low, but it's not zero. So, cancer, I've been over this before, I think, here. Cancer is a toxicity state. Cancer is an accumulated toxicity state. It is your body making extra tissue to accommodate, to accumulate more toxins so they're not stored, they're not floating around your blood, causing you to die early. Cancer is a last-ditch effort by your body to create more storage for toxicity. Jill asks, how does a person know if they are copper toxic or deficient? I don't treat copper deficiency. Otherwise, we test. I test hair and blood. Here she says, symptoms are similar. As Grant Jenneru pointed out in his books, the symptoms of vitamin A toxicity and vitamin A deficiency are exactly the same. What? Could this be true? If we find that vitamin A is not... A vi so the thing is, is, serum levels. I just talked to you about toxic metals, right? The body will take serum toxic metals out of the blood as quickly as it possibly can to store them, to get them out of the blood. Copper. If copper's running high in the blood, you know you're taking in a lot. But also what I've seen is when people get really toxic and they're what I call an undertype, which has an article in the Love Your Liver program. I talk about undertypes and overtypes. When livers get really toxic, I actually believe that they can't get rid of the poisons. And so they're mainly storing them. And this is why they're in a bad way. Because at least the, the overtypes who have, let's say, high ferritin, higher vitamin A, higher copper, they're getting it out of the liver, at least, into the bile, which is then leaking into the blood. That's why these things are high in the blood. But at least they're making more bile and they're getting rid of it. Whereas the undertypes are not, in my, this is a theory. This is all theory, but they're not clearing it from the liver. And this is why they are more sensitive and they are generally in a worse state. Because they're not getting rid of it out of the, it's not leaving the liver. It's getting stuck. It's all theory. But it's funny, as I start to get people's livers better, we see their levels on these things often increasing. We can take people who have been iron deficient, iron deficient, low ferritin for years. We don't give them iron. We work on their liver and their ferritin comes back up into normal levels. I went over this in a testimonial a week or two before. We don't have to always give iron to raise iron levels. People who take iron to raise their iron levels like ladies when you're pregnant, pregnancy, pregnancy uncovers how unhealthy your liver is, ladies. That's what pregnant when you if you have a really hard pregnancy, it's showing you that your liver is really toxic. Because ladies, when you go through hormonal shifts like your menstrual cycle, like pregnancy, like menopause, when you go through these big hormonal shifts. It shows you often just how toxic you are. It stirs it all up because you've got all these hormones coming into your liver and now your liver has to process all these hormones too. In addition to the copper toxicity, in addition to the vitamin A toxicity, in addition to the wacky herbs you're taking to try to balance your hormones or the essential oils that you're poisoning yourself with, all of it. Or the perfumes or the toxic cosmetics that you smear all over yourself every day. Guys, you and the body sprays, geez, quit that toxic sh shite. Anyway, Jill says, I have very high hair copper, but feel deficient with lack of skin pigment spots, dry, saggy skin, depression. You, ha you have very high hair copper. You are copper toxic, not deficient. This is what I fix every day. 
Uh, Van Geezer says gooseberry slash amla has some aluminum, aluminum. Many don't know about this. Many don't know that gooseberry or amla is a nightshade. No, no, I'm sorry. Goose, no, I'm you're saying goose. I'm thinking of wolfberry. I'm thinking, sorry, that was a mistake. Wolfberry. Uh, yeah. But amla, yeah, a lot of people do the amla for the natural vitamin C. I don't suggest it. It's also super high in polyphenols, which are toxic. Phenols, toxic. Polyphenols, toxic. So, yeah. Um, Van Geezer says, how bad are canned sardine, pink salmon in terms of heavy metals? I can tell on a hair test if people are eating fish. Guaranteed. The more fish you eat, the higher your mercury is going to... Mercury and cadmium. Most, most people don't know that cadmium's in fish and shellfish, too. But typically on a hair test, the way it looks on the trace elements hair test, the mercury is a higher level and the cadmium is a lower, lower, and they just depend upon what you eat because different ones are going to have different ones, but they move up and down together. What do we use to detox them? Zinc and selenium. But if you keep eating them, they're going to keep showing up. And then you're going to have the, the metal, whatever the metals are that the canned, the sardine can and the, the salmon can that's going to have it. If you got, if you got a liner on the salmon can, the fat of the salmon's going to soak up whatever that liner has in it. I, the less canned stuff, I mean, canned is all right. It's all right. Canned beans, you know, it's canned. It means canned. It's, it's in a metal container. There's the metal on the container. There's the liner, maybe the liner, maybe not. Do I use some canned beans on occasion? Yeah. Do I would I want to use canned foods on a daily basis? I'm not so sure. If there was other options. But canned fish, all fish and shellfish has mercury in it. I can tell about how often people eat fish or shellfish on a weekly basis based on their hair mercury. Funny thing, it doesn't matter where the fish came from if it's wild or farm raised or whatever. It it shows up. You eat sushi, it's a disaster on your hair test. It is. I see this all the time. And now we're to the point where we have people getting, they, they, we have people who have stopped eating fish and shellfish for like a year, year and a half. And all of a sudden their mercury, their, which is only fish and shellfish on a hair test. It's organic mercury, methyl mercury that shows up on a hair test. It's not, hair tests do not show you mercury filling toxicity. If you think they do, you're wrong. They do not show you mercury filling toxicity, which is inorganic mercury. Okay. We see people dump methyl mercury, organic mercury on hair tests. Cause they'll be like, I haven't eaten fish in a year, year and a half. And all of a sudden their mercury spikes up and then it drops back down. What did we do to do that? Well, we got their body good enough that it could start dumping the mercury and we see it on the hair test and then it goes back down. We see this all the time with toxic metals. But all fish and shellfish has got mercury in it. I can't, I can't make generalizations as sardines are. I mean, generally, the smaller the fish, sardines are in theory going to be better than the bigger fish in terms of like salmon. Because the bigger fish, you know, you got the little fish and the bigger fish eats that one and the bigger fish eats that one and the bigger fish eats that one. It's called bioaccumulation. Bioaccumulation. Would that be like storing? but the liver and the kidneys don't store toxins. They call it bioaccumulation, genius. Not, I'm not talking to you, Van Geezer. I'm just saying, all the people who say that your liver doesn't store toxins, I'm sorry, they're just wrong. You would call it scientifically incompetent, maybe. Oh, so Van Geezer said, are there other heavy metals in fish other than the famous mercury issue? Yes, cadmium. And there's all sorts of fatty toxins. Everything we're putting in the ocean, just remember, everything that we're putting in the oceans, all those oceans are connected eventually, right? And the fish are essentially marinating in that poison. They're, they're sucking this water in through their mouth and through their gills, right? So if you were breathing toxic smoke, you would expect it's going to come into your lungs. You're going to absorb it. But what about the fish breathing the water that has all these poisons in it? Do you think they're going to absorb some of it? Of course they are. 
Here, let me do this. Let me see. find the <laughs> here's an article from uh, for those of you who wonder why there's so many weird things happening with people not being able to figure out what uh, what gender they are naturalsociety.com I'll post this link medications found in water are changing the sex of fish Medications found in water are changing the sex of fish. Where was the one? There was one with like birth control. A recent report from the U.S. Geological Survey, USGS, found that birth control hormones excreted by women flushed into waterways and eventually into drinking water can also impact fish fertility up to three generations after exposure. Hmm. Three generations. Gosh. Almost like they want to affect the fertility of people. I've been over the study here from the journal, the Cell Journal about where when they gave, when they poisoned mother rats with vitamin A, the males, the male babies, they poisoned them while they were pregnant. The male baby rats or mice, doesn't really matter which one it was, it was one of the two. They were born with ovarian tissue in their testicles. So too much vitamin A was actually, being that I tell you that vitamin A is estrogenic, the males were being born with ovarian tissue in their testicles. Now, if we were wondering why there were so many men today, let me find that journal. So many men today who feel like they're a woman inside, Might they actually be being truthful? Do you see? Are they necessarily making it up? Are they saying, I'm like a man on the outside, but I feel like something else on the inside? I'm going to try to find this paper. Oh, wait, I didn't do vitamin A. Let's see if this is it. No, wrong journal. But here, guys, here's a paper, Regulation and Perturbation. That's disturbing. Of testicular functions by, by vitamin A. Hmm. Perturbation. Of course, they're going to say that it's, they're, they're going to look in here and they're gonna be like, you need it. Um, an excess of vitamin A leads to testicular lesions and spermatogenic disorders. Come on, let me find this paper. Eh, maybe I'm not going to find it today. Got one change in my search. Yeah. 
some reason when I'm sitting this close to, close to the computer, I can't get my fingers on the right keys. Why can I not find this paper? Maybe the paper's been <laughs> disappeared. Let me go to PubMed. Let's go to the source. Okay. I need to find this paper again. Well, here we have something that's probably based on this paper, the feminizing ability of retinoic acid. The feminizing ability of retinoic acid in the DMRT mutant, DMRT1 mutant somatic testes suggests that retinoic acid might play normally play a role in somatic cell differentiation or cell fate maintenance in the ovary. I'm guessing they used this other paper that I'm talking about. I want to find it. I gotta find that paper. I've been over it before, I think. Remember, Bill Gates loves, Bill Gates loves vitamin A. He figures out any possible way he can to give it to people. The Gates Foundation gives lots of money to Planned Parenthood. This is on their website. They love helping with birth control, which raises vitamin A and copper, and they love giving vitamin A to people. Um... So I think we're out of time today. So didn't get too many questions, but uh, let me just look if there was any super chats that snuck in. Okay, no super chats. Thanks for all the comments, people. Someday, you know, if you if you really have a hankering to get your question answered, Jiminy Christmas, there's a lot of chats today. Wow. That's super awesome. Now, you guys, go and, you know, just if you leave a comment or you leave a like or, you know, X out of the chat, leave a like. It helps the algo to push this to more people so we can help more people so we can <laughs> unbrainwash people to the lies that they've been told. There's a reason why everyone's so sick today. Like one of the studies I just found the other day, tattoos, people who had tattoos on average were living 14 years shorter than people who didn't have tattoos in the study. I may do a big Twitter thread on, on tattoos. 
then people are going to say, well, what do I, should I do? Should I keep my tattoo or should I try to get it taken off? I don't know. I don't know. Either way, you're exposed to toxicity. You put toxicity in your skin. Toxic metals, toxic synthetic pigments, toxic natural pigments. So like as an example, we've got people out there. I think it said 30. I think I saw a stat 36% of people, I think, or it was either people or women under 40 had at least one tattoo. We're being poisoned. Sometimes we do it willingly and we pay other people to do it to us. Like mercury fillings. Like tattoos. Like copper water pipes. Like vitamin A fortification of our foods. Like pharmaceuticals. And then they lie in the nutrition. Science. The way out of this is we do three things in this approach. We stop putting the poisons in by learning what they are because most of you don't know what real poisons are. You like think vitamin A is good for you. Don't, it's not. It's a plant poison. And when it goes into an animal, it's a metabolized plant poison. We stop putting the poisons in. We help the body to get rid of toxins, but not too fast. Or you're going to pay for it. You're going to have a bad time if you try to push it too fast. And then we give the body what it needs in terms of especially minerals to help protect itself and to get rid of the poisons. As you saw today with the lead poisoning. Us getting the lead down three times faster than the doctor would have expected. By using good minerals, the minerals the body needs. So when we detox to heavy metals, not only are we making the body healthier by giving it minerals that it needed to begin with, but we're getting rid of the toxic metals without having to use any of this weird chelator stuff, which depletes good minerals. So remember, you take a chelator, you grab onto toxic metals. Yes, you also grab onto good metal, metals, minerals. So at the end of your chelation, you are now, you may be less toxic, but you're also less mineral filled of good minerals too. And when they give you those little mineral combos to refill you and they, they've got copper in them and manganese in them, then they're making you more toxic. Serious. I watched it. Naturopathic school, working with one of the biggest names of detox out there. And now I'm like, oh, now I know why people would throw up the multivitamin, the 12 pills a day multivitamin that he was giving them. You know how much vitamin A was in there? There was like 10,000 of retinol, retinol palmitate, and 25,000 of beta carotene. And people would throw it up. Weird. I don't know why they would do that. It's full of all sorts of other garbage, too. And then there's like the, there's a company that I do use some of their products, but they make a little six mineral combo. I think it's six minerals and copper, manganese. It's, it's garbage. Like I would never use it on anybody. So anyway, oh wow, we got 28 likes out of 38 people who are here. That's pretty good. If you haven't done the like, go do it. I got to wrap it up. I got to go do my inner circle on the network. So remember, if you want to work with me, go to nutritiondetective.com. Look on the consultations tab, or you can email Julie if you got questions. Admin at nutritiondetective.com. Admin, A-D-M-I-N, at nutritiondetective.com. If you want to just join the Love Your Liver program, which is a do-it-yourself program, you are not getting direct guidance from me. That is a do-it-yourself program. 1,300 people in there that you can ask questions to. That is at members.nutritiondetective.com. If you are planning on working with me, sign up for the consultation. Don't join the Love Your Liver program because you get that automatically as part of working with me. So if you want to look into the supplements I mentioned, that's at nutritiondetective.com under the supplements. We have the lactoferrin and the keystone minerals. And then I will see you all next week. Bye now. Have a great weekend.